<laughs> and uh, we want to welcome all those who are watching on the online version of this as well. And so we're going to be looking tonight at uh, the skeletal stru structure of uh, the church. And of course you need to have the master plan of the church. And you need to have read chapters 1 and 2 for this particular lecture. Uh, what I want to begin with tonight is just talking a little bit uh, what the church is and uh, what it should be according to Scripture. We're going to be looking at what is known as the skeletal structure of the church. And uh, just kind of as an introduction, uh, John MacArthur talks about church leaders, and this will be on your quiz, uh, talks about church leaders as having uh, two, like having two kinds of occupations. Uh, one is a shepherd. We're all familiar with the shepherd. What does a shepherd do? Herd sheep. Herd sheep, right. Uh, biblical shepherd back in the Old Testament would protect the sheep, watch over the sheep. Uh, when the enemy came, the shepherd would chase the thing off or shoot it, kill it somehow. <laughs> Uh, when I say shoot it, that's going to be David and his slingshot. Uh, so, what does that tell us about the role of the leader in the church then? Protector. A protector? A guide. A guide? An instructor. An instructor? Someone who cares? An authentic shepherd should care for his sheep, right? And he's a healer too. Okay. Anything else? He's a protector of the territory. Okay. He has to water and feed those sheep. Uh, that's a very important uh, process in the church as a church leader. Uh, shepherds are pretty important, aren't they? In the life of the church. You notice that I, I, I heard this somewhere and I wish I could remember where but uh, a fellow told me that he had noticed over in Israel that all the shepherds were leading their sheep. But then he noticed that one particular man was behind the sheep and trying to push them forward and he wasn't doing a very good job and the reason being is he was driving them to the market he's just trying to get rid of the sheep and there's a big difference God calls us to lead them not to drive them and so that that's one thing that we need to understand about church leadership and the John MacArthur says that church leadership is ministry not management we go on to understand that church leaders are also like construction workers if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 9 and 10, we find that Paul was talking about a wise master builder. He's talking about someone who builds. And, and you and I are also like construction workers in the leadership of the church. So I want you to remember these two things because they'll come up and this may be a good topic for you to write on uh, concerning this. Now, he talks about the skeletal structure and he says that it has five parts. We're going to discuss those five parts over the next several minutes. Uh, the five parts of the structure begins with a high view of God. Uh, turn to your Bibles for a moment to Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9. In Proverbs 10, 9, the Bible says, and I might have the wrong way. I have the wrong verse. I do have the wrong verse. <laughs> and why I wrote Proverbs 10, 9, I have no idea. And I know where this is found. This is in Proverbs. Well, I'm going to mess up. The fear of the Lord is what? knowledge. The beginning of wisdom. wisdom. When he uses the word fear, what kind of fear is he talking about? Um, we're really talking on understanding God. Okay. Reverence. Reverence. 
Let me go a little bit further with that. What is the goal of the church? And fear has a, a part of this now. What is the goal of the church? If you ever read the Shorter Westminster Catechism, it tells us what it is. You know what it is? Um, but to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Right. The chief end of man is to glorify God. Well, how do we do that? How does man glorify God? What is, what is the church so, supposed to be doing as it comes together to glorify God? And I think is the main goal of the church. Worship. Anybody know? Worship. I'm going to have to get someone to show me how to do this too. It's worship. Well, I'm not having very big, good success with this today. I hate when we get new tools and have to learn them. Josh, I might have to get you to help me with this. There it is. Okay, I'll be on that. Again. And so the goal of the church is worship, right? Because we are to glorify God. Well, let me ask you another question. What is worship? What is worship? Describing worth. Describing worth. Okay, I like that. Praise. Praise, love. love, exalting, exalting. We could use the word reverence because we just did that with the proverbs. There, fear is the begin. You know, fear of the Lord. Well, I'm going to give you a definition here that I want you to write down. Uh, it is my definition. Let me stand out of the way a little bit so you can see it. But worship is an expression of our ultimate love for an object we value. Now let me stop there for a moment because when we worship, it could be just about anything we worship. There are some people that worship nature. There are some people that worship celebrities. There are some people that worship their cars or, or their families. In other words, they have an expression of their ultimate love for an object that they value. However, what is authentic worship? Authentic worship is an expression of our ultimate love for God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to think about that. What do we mean by an expression of love? First of all, we're told in Deuteronomy 6, 5, that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart. That's the heart of worship. The heart of worship is loving God, but love is always expressed. At least this kind of love is. Am I on your way, brother? I'm trying to move way over here then. So love is expressed in what kind of ways? Think about a worship setting, first of all. Obedience. Obedience. Put yourself in the church pew on a Sunday morning. How are you expressing your love? Giving. And being faithful. Giving. giving. Tithing. Giving. That, that is an expression of worship. <clears throat> what else? By just being there. Okay, <laughs> just being there. Being in the room. Okay. <laughs> Share with me some other expressions. What are some other expressions of worship, of, of your love and worship? Singing. Singing. Singing and praising. Uh, loving one another. Loving one another. Serving in the church. Serving in the church. I mean, if you, I had a lady several years ago when I was at a, a church nearby who uh, was taking a Master Life class. And we were talking about spiritual gifts, and she said, well, I really don't do much for the church. I, I really don't have any spiritual gifts. And, and basically, she was basically saying, I don't have any expression. 
but I had to stop and remind her. She, when it came time for vacation Bible school, guess who was there serving the cookies and Kool-Aid? Was that not an expression of her love for our Lord and Savior, working with those children? Another thing she did was uh, for Alita and I, we, we had a very young family, and, and you know how money is. Money's tight when you have families. And she would cut out coupons for us out of the newspaper and give them to us. She didn't have much to give, but that was something that she could do. Was that not an expression of worship, of her love for her Savior? Because she wasn't doing it for herself, and she wasn't just doing it for us. She was doing it because God loved her, and she loved God. Now, the flip side of that, we have to also remember that not every expression is an expression of worship. You can give a tithe and it not be worship. How could that be? Larry, how could that be? You can give a tithe and not worship? Yeah. Well, by definition. I mean, worship, in, in the sense we're talking about, is uh, a visible showing, outward expression, you know. Uh, of love. Of love. Uh, tithe is uh, basically uh, told by God that give a tenth. Okay. Well, let me stop you there. Think about it. Uh, Kenneth, I'll be right with you on this. Think about it. For some people, it would be an expression of worship, and for some other people, it may not be. Why? What's the difference, Kenneth? Given reluctantly. Yeah, yeah remember what the Bible says about giving grudgingly? He doesn't want us to do that. You know, the chip of so it begins where? Right here in the heart. So we need to understand. Listen, there are all sorts of groups of people that are doing good things in this world. Can I mention the Mormons? Do you know a better group of people? I mean, they're great people. They make great neighbors. Uh, they do a lot of charitable things. They go to their church every Sunday. They are faithful in their giving. But what separates them from those who truly worship? Number one, they don't have a relationship. And number two, they're doing it for what reason? Self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. They were they're no different than the uh, you know, the Sadducees and the Pharisees who were all trying to to impress God with their rituals. By the way, we can't impress God. Did you know that? Amen. We can't. It's just not possible. Only thing that pleases God is our faith in Him. And that means total dependence and reliance upon Him. And so there is a, a fine line here about worship. And worship being, I believe, the core value of the church because out of our worship, out of our love for Jesus, grows all these other things. Our giving. Our witnessing. Our discipling. Our fellowship. All of these things. And so the structure of the church is uh, worship. So in order to have great worship, what must you have? you got to have a high view of God. And that's the first part of the structure. you got to have a high view of God. You, you have to see God as the Bible sees God. I'm afraid that a lot of people have a low view of God. And even a lower view of who Jesus Christ is. Sometimes we act as if he's our buddy. He's, he's not our buddy. The Lord Jesus Christ as he is presented in Revelation chapter 1. Remember what happened to John when he came into the presence of this one? He fell down as if he was a dead man. We forget that we need to have a high view. We have a holy God. A God that is worthy of our worship. A God that should be feared righteously. 
That's where we need to start with the church. We start with worship, and worship means we need to have a high view of God. What happens if you have a low view of God in worship? Can you? I think if we turn that around a little bit, it's the high view, low view. I think for me, it is that make sure as far as the shepherd that God's been identified in your life so you can get it right with your people. Absolutely. Because when we stand in the pulpit or we stand before the church or stand before a Sunday school class or work with people, you know, in, in the settings that you have to counsel people in, we, we don't want them to see us. And if you have a high view of God, this is what you would desire. Now, this is what every church should desire, isn't it? Now, is this happening? You know, I think it's a struggle right now. Why is it such a struggle for churches to have a high view of God? There's a, there's a misconception by the shepherds uh, well, that. that they uh, uh, have a view of God that is not scriptural. Okay. Well, that true. That is so true. We'll get to that in a few moments. We'll talk a little bit about that. Yes. Tolerance. A lot of churches uh, uh, want to concentrate on members, so they are very tolerant. Yeah. I, you know, it's easy to get into the church than a lot of these country clubs around us, folks. It really is. What? First of all, let me tell you something about being a member of a church. You can join and have your name on a roll. It doesn't mean that you're actually a member of the church. And you know that. Right. You have to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to... Uh, I love it when I work with the children. We talk about the ABCs. You know the ABCs of salvation? Any of you do? A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus is the Son of God and died on the cross for your sins and rose again. C, confess Him as your Lord and Savior. It doesn't get much easier than that, does it? But yet it's so hard because something gets in the way and it gets in the way also of this. And that's us. We're turned inward. A lot of times we go to church, and I hear people say this all the time. You've heard people say this as well. Well, I'm going to go to that church because it's going to personally meet my needs. Well, that's fine, I guess, on a certain level, but that's not what it's all about. Why does God save us? saves us so that we can be his worshiper. I think in Revelation it said, uh, Thou worthy, O God, great honor for your pleasure where we created you. Yeah. And, and that's a great verse. You know, I, I think one of the things that scares a lot of people about heaven, when we talk about heaven, is they think, oh, we're going to be up there singing song after song after song. And just... Listen, worship is more than just singing. Worship is serving God and using the spiritual gifts in which He's given us. And if we can't get it right here, well, we're, we get to heaven, we, 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 there better be a learning curve for us, right? Because we, we can practice that and do that right here now. Be a worshiper. But we've got to have a high view of who God is. Is that high view the same thing as a definitive view? That would be defined? Okay, yeah. Because, you know, the Bible with, with Israel is about them not defining him right. Right. And oh, the, yeah. And the shepherds that they had were not getting him right. How many times, and we talked about this in the book of Daniel right. last semester, how many times was Israel mixing uh, the worship of Baal and the worship of Yahweh? Right. In fact, it got so bad at times that they were interchanging the name. Right. Well, they had really lost the uh, really defining moment of who God is. And that's basically why the temple right. was destroyed. Right, yes. Um, let me read a couple passages. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with what? All your heart. We talked about that, Psalms 95, 6, and 7. Oh, come, let us bow down and worship Him. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. 
There there's identification. We are His. We belong to Him. By the way, He's Creator. And shouldn't we worship the Creator? I mean, you know, we came into this world with nothing. We leave with nothing. And the only thing that we're going to get is what God gives us. I think the high view is that most religions believe there is a God. But they, they, the, the, when we preach from the pulpit, we have to make sure we identify him correctly. Okay. He said, I, he told about, I am God. Beside me, there is no other. No other, right. And, uh, and in other words, he was telling them, uh, you know, uh, the Ten Commandments. It mm -hmm. starts off with the four things. It's about God, and the other six is about my relationship with you. If you don't get me right, you can't have a relationship with the people right. Okay. What do you think of this quote? Let me read a quote from John MacArthur. Tell me what you think. Uh, it's about Mary and Martha from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. People tend to be irreverent. They do not know how to worship God. Some people think that worship is anything that induces a warm feeling. They know little about God. There are too many Marthas and not enough Marys in the church. It's on page 25 in your text. What do you think about that? That some people think that worship is anything that induces a warm feeling. The warm fuzzies, I like to call it. We have a, that's where defining God is important. Do we have a fuzzy wuzzy, lovey dovey God? Or do we have a God of holiness that we're to bow down and worship? Now, I'm not saying God's not a God of love because we know that He is. We, in fact, He sent His Son because of His great love for us. But sometimes we get the wrong idea of who we, we forget. I think the church has forgotten that we are to be in awe of God. Think about that. Uh, some of the great sanctuaries around the world were built so that when people would step into it, they would get that awe, that sense of awe. And sometimes we need to be reminded of the sense of awe that we should have. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Let me see if I can click this ahead again. Isaiah chapter 6. You all know the passage. It's one of my favorite passages to preach. The scripture says, uh, it's tough when you get a new Bible. It doesn't turn like it's supposed to. <laughs> and the scripture says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Here he is, he's having a vision. He's having a vision of being in God's holy sanctuary. And what does he see? He says, sees the Lord. He sees the Lord sitting on a throne. He's high and lifted up. He's above him. And the robe, and the train of his robe filled the entire temple. And above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried out and said, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. Or in English, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. Notice the Lord capitalized there, Yahweh, Jehovah, the covenant name for God. The whole earth is full of his glory. The word glory is a word that means to be heavy. It's something that is almost indescribable. Can you imagine the glory of God? It is far brighter than you and I could ever imagine. We can never look at it. Not with human eyes. And it says that the whole earth is full of His glory. And he goes on to say, And the posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And so how did he respond? He responded by raising his hands and, and saying, Oh, happy day. Right? He had the warm, fuzzy feeling, and he knew that he was in a good spot. Is that what happened? He got a little scared there. 
got a little scared. <laughs> Talk about the fear of the Lord. All of a sudden, he, he's crying out and he says, Woe for me! I am destroyed! I am undone! He was standing in the presence of Almighty God. What a sight that must have been. Something that's hard for you and I to imagine, and I'm afraid that it's hard for the church to really get a picture of this today, but yet, this is such an important element to have a high view of God, a God who is high and lifted up, a God who is worthy of our worship, a God who is holy, a God so that when we're standing in front of Him, we understand that we are sinners, there is nothing righteous about us, and that we're undone. We're destroyed. Apart from the fact there is one that went before us, the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm afraid we've lost that all. I'm afraid when we go into church, it's just the same old routine. What does that say about our personal relationship with Jesus? I'm scaring you all now, all right? <laughs> I don't think we, we don't have a person. Well, that, that's the problem. Some don't. And, and some aren't growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ because they only pick up a Bible once a week. And unfortunately, for some folks, 18 inches of pew is their total worship experience for the week. I think the only thing, you know, we're afraid nowadays, in some cases, not to give them a high view because it makes them afraid. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, when you start talking about the uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you identify God, a lot of people want to have the talk show mentality. Let's sit down and talk about prosperity. Let's sit down and talk about how God can open up his ATM machine. Mm -hmm. And then when you start talking about, uh, like, in, when Jesus was talking, and, and there's a passage in John 666. It said they left Jesus. Because as long as he fed them 5,000 loaves of fish and bread, they followed him. But when he said, if you eat my flesh, yeah. and, and they, it said that they left him. Right. So when, they start, when, when he started talking high, spiritual matter, they said, this is too hard for me to understand. They left. Yeah. They, yeah. They, they, and he asked the disciples, he said, would you also leave? And, and that, was a, that, that was in the Gospel of John. It's a very, yeah, I love that passage. Right. Because it's a telling passage, and, and I'm afraid that uh, today's structure in which we have in the church, the way the church has uh, progressed over the years, and the way we allow traditions to overtake what scriptures teaches, right. we've gotten ourselves into a fix. But Professor, do you think it's, it was uh, God that when he said that they didn't follow him anymore, it was John, the 6th chapter, the 66th verse, the number of the beast? Huh. Never thought about it that way. The sixth chapter, the sixth six verses. It's interesting. It said that they did not follow him anymore. Yeah. That's a good definition for Antichrist. Yeah, because uh, people are going to follow after him and not not the truth. But listen, it won't even take an Antichrist. It, it doesn't take much for people to not want to come and worship God. Uh, there are all sorts of substitutes out in this world that we have replaced our worship with. And I'm afraid that that's creep, that has crept into our churches as well. And, and we no longer have a regenerate uh, church body, but an unregenerate church. We have a lot of folks that are on our rolls that aren't saved, that don't have a personal relationship. But let me take it one step further. Those of us who do have a personal relationship with God, how strong is that relationship? See, worship just doesn't begin on Sunday and end on Sunday. Worship should be our life. If it's the goal of the church, it should be the goal of the Christian individual. And, and it should be a, a, a constant thing because, again, remember what I said worship was. It's an expression of love. It begins with that love in our heart. We shall love the Lord our God with all our hearts, right? right. If that's where it begins, that should be happening all the time. But why does our love wane? Why does it seem to... Uh, to disappear. Okay, so uh, with Israel, for instance, it was because uh, they started mixing. They had multiple altars. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they got uh, going here and going there, different doctrine, different opinion. The shepherd allowed them to get outside the gate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not trying to beat up the church, so don't you know? Don't take that. You know, we're we're here in the class together. And those who are watching on video, we're not trying to beat up the church. But what we do need to get to is the idea of how do we get back to this. How do we get back to that? How do we get people to catch the awe of God? I think one way we catch, get people to catch the awe of, awe of God is when we have it ourselves. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid there are too many folks stepping into the pulpits today don't have an awe for God. And so what I'm saying, it starts with you all. It starts with me. If we don't have that awe for God and we're stepping into the pulpit and we're not bowing... Listen, God can use... Anybody, I understand that. And God's doing His work today. But if we want to see a greater work, we have to recapture this in our own hearts. It means we got to... Where are you going to find out about God? Where are you going to learn about God and grow close to God? His Word. His Word. But I'm afraid it's not happening. I, I, was, I, I think I shared uh, a statistic. I think I wrote it down. I know I have it here somewhere. And I don't remember. Here it is. I was sharing from a 2005 Facts and Trends Ellis report that 16% of pastors are satisfied with their prayer lives. Satisfied with what? With their prayer lives. So what about everybody else? The majority of pastors aren't satisfied with their prayer lives. And it says that the average time spent in prayer by a pastor, an evangelical, Bible-believing pastor, is 30 minutes a day. That might sound a lot to some people. Uh, I'm not so sure it really is. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Yes. And the average believer, evangelical, Praise 10 minutes a day. Do you know why? We've lost that. We've lost it. And we need to get this back, don't we? In order to have revival. We move on to the... What we got? We'll learn this thing yet. A high view of God means we must have a high view of Scripture. Is that important? I think so. The second thing that he tells us that we need in this structure of the church, the backbone, the whole structure, as he talks about the skeletal structure of the church, he says we need the absolute authority of Scripture. We need the absolute authority of Scripture. According to Chuck Swindle in his book, The Church Awakening, he mentions that there are four essentials to the church, teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. And he gets this, he goes to Acts chapter 2 and 3, and, and we'll look at that some maybe tonight. Uh, but it says in that, he, he, he has this discussion about how important it is that very thing, that very first thing, teaching. Because the teaching has to be grounded in something. The teaching of the church should be grounded in what? Joel Steen's latest book? Dr. Phil. Huh? Dr. Phil. <laughs> Dr. Phil? <laughs> Maybe Oprah. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I do know happens to be this right here. The Word of God. And in order to, and this is kind of to me a circle, but in order to have a high view of Scripture, I think you need to have a high view of God. And in order to have a high view of God, you have to have a high view of Scripture. I, I think they, they go hand in hand. I don't, I don't think you can separate those two. And so the question is, do we have a high view of Scripture? Do we? 
The Bible tells us about God. God is a man. God is not a man who lies. So what does that tell us about Scripture? Because it is God's Word. What does it tell us? It's true. It's true. It has to be true. Let me ask you another question here. Let's see if I can pull it up. Why is it important for the church to have a high view of Scripture? Because it is God's Word. It is God's Word. I agree with you. Anybody want to take that further? Without it, then we end up following any sort of doctrine that comes along and we end up pluralistic. Yeah, that, that's true. Simple form, you are what you eat. Okay, I like that. You are what you eat. Look at what he says again. The absolute authority of Scripture. What do we mean by absolute? It, 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 has, it has no error. Okay. It's the only one that is fully holy and God-breathed. Right, okay. There, there should be no other authority. Okay, it's, it's not about, you know, uh, let me, can I tell you a story? I was, this happened a few years ago. I was watching, um, oh, what was his name? Larry King. And Larry King had a, had a couple of pastors on there. And I'm going to tell you who they were. Jerry Falwell, which I have great respect for the way he has put together that school. I know he's home with the Lord. But he was a great organizer. And Billy Graham. And Larry King was asking them different questions uh, about the Bible. And as they were going through, and I'm not picking on any of these men, okay, because I love them both. But Jerry kept saying, well, I believe, da-da-da-da. And a few minutes later, Larry would, I mean, Larry would ask another question, and Jerry would say, I believe, da-da-da-da. And I understand the context in which he was saying that. But when they asked Billy Graham, Billy Graham in his voice, well, the Bible says, and, and I'm not saying that Jerry Fowell didn't have the Bible as authority. He absolutely did. But I love the way Billy Graham answered because it showed that the Bible was his absolute authority and nothing else. Not the Sunday school quarterly, uh, not, you know, Dr. Warren Wiersbe's book, which I love Warren Wiersbe, but the final absolute authority for him was the Bible. And folks, that's all you and I have to stand up on when we stand before the church and be a church leader. And that's all the church has to stand on. It is absolutely important for the church to have a high view of the Bible. And to have a high view of God. Without it, we're just kind of floating around in space. Without it, it causes all sorts of church problems. You know, we, we have to break out Robert's Rules of Order. We have to break out all these other things to settle all these issues and get the church constitution out. And I want to tell you something, folks. Hang the church constitution. This is it. I'm not saying you shouldn't have one, but it better be biblical. And I've seen a lot that haven't been biblical. Larry, uh, when I was at my first my first pastorate, I asked for a copy of my of the church constitution. Oh, we don't know where it is, Pastor. A year into being there, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm just going to be up front with you all. You don't mind, do you? I had a white church, and not because the building was white. It was white too, but it was lily white, okay? I had friends at the college that were Hispanic and black, and, and, and you know, I loved them all. I never really thought about it much. And then one day I came across a copy of the church constitution. And Larry, I about flipped out. You could not become a member of my church. In fact, you weren't welcomed at my church according to that church constitution. Pharisee. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was, buddy, I was burnt. I mean, I was, I was getting very fleshed 
spike in, the, in, the, in that situation. And we dealt with it, by the way. And uh, it's amazing how God does the work. And, and just how God and just turned the hearts of those people. And, and I, I, you know, to this day, I, I'm happy because it was a work of God. I would have never convinced them, Larry. I could have never convinced them. Although I could convince them through the Scripture saying, hey, folks, this is wrong. Let me show you where. And, and it took a lot of teaching. But, but they tore up that Constitution and got rid of it. And they repented of that sin and, and took care of that. And uh, just amazing uh, the change that those folks had. Uh, but we need to be careful. We need to be careful because that church may have said, hey, the Word of God is our absolute authority. But was it? No. No. They may have said it, but they weren't practicing it. And I dare say that there are many churches today in that same boat. Well, I said a lot about the shepherd has to be courageous. Yeah, and it's hard. Listen, I know I've been fired from a church already. And I'm still trying to figure out why. Because I love those people, and I know God called me to that church. And I knew what I was doing was what God wanted me to do. Was I a perfect pastor? No. But I was doing what God wanted me to do. And so that's a difficult, you know, it's hard, Larry. It's hard for some of these men today to stand up. But listen, if we don't, we're in trouble. Now, I'm not saying to be antagonistic and to tear the church apart, but what I am saying is to challenge the church with God's teaching. I believe as a pastor, God called me to, when God calls me to a church, I'm to take that church from where it's at and move it forward. But I need to understand where they're at. Same thing when we're dealing with people and sharing the gospel or we're helping somebody who has fallen and we're working to restore them. We've got, we got to take them where they're at and move them forward. And, and that's not always an th easy thing to do, but one of the things we need to do is help them to see that. First of all, the authority of God's Scripture. You know, we can get most people to say they believe in the Bible. I was witnessing to a man one time and his fiance, they were getting, they wanted to get married. They wanted me to marry him, and uh, asked him if he was saved, and he said, "No, I'm not saved." He said, "Not sure I, I need to be saved," and I shared with him. And and uh, one of the funny things is, along the way, I asked him, "Do you believe in the Bible?" And he says, "Yes." So okay, we got to talking, and we got to talking about heaven and hell, and he says, "Well, I believe there's a heaven, but I don't believe there's a hell." And I said, you just told me you believe the Bible. Well, I do. Well, I opened up my Bible and he says, well, I guess there is a hell. I'm afraid that there are a lot of people like that today that don't really know what the Bible says. And, and that's an unsaved person, but I think he can carry that into the church and the church doesn't know what the Bible said. Those people didn't understand, Larry, mm -hmm. what the Bible said about that particular issue. It was quite interesting. You said that uh, people came to me for uh, marriage counseling. I asked the lady I knew. She said, "I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross." I said, "It rose on the third day with all power." And I asked the man. He said, "I don't know." I said, "Well, I can't marry y'all. Mm -hmm. you, I can't because you're going to get married in the house of God. Yeah. You be if you're going to get married and not get the blessing of the church, you go to the courthouse, but not under the auspices of God. You know." And he. About three weeks later, he came back to say he wanted to be baptized. She convinced him, you know. The <laughs> <laughs> I, well, thought, I well, thought it was funny. <laughs> well, after our discussion on hell, I have to tell you, this man did trust Christ as a Savior. And so uh, that was an interesting. Let me read you another quote that comes out of your book. Uh, we're going to discuss this for a moment. And I have a feeling it's a quiz question. Okay? And here's the quote. I, it's found on page 27 of your text. One of the worst assaults on God's Word comes from people who say they believe the Bible but don't know what it teaches. Boy, isn't that so true? Let me read that again. One of the worst assaults on God's Word comes from people who say they believe the Bible but don't know what it teaches. The Bible, as I said, I believe is our church constitution. And I would argue that if we're obedient to God's word, 
much of what happens in churches wouldn't happen today. I really believe that. And, and so we need to get back to that. Yes? What page did you say that was on? That's on page 27 of your text. <coughs> so somewhere. Can't find it? I can't find it. Okay. I wonder if we have a different edition of text. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's somewhere in there. Well, okay. I will help you find it later. How's that? So I got an old one. You all have new ones, and I'm in trouble. <laughs> Your quiz question is going to be something like this. What did John MacArthur Jr. say was one of the worst assaults on God's Word? And you're going to say... People who say they don't the Bible don't really know. Okay, good. <laughs> Look at page 24. It's on page 24? Oh, yeah. wow. This edition is 1991. Well, it goes by your IBS number. What's the last few digits of your ISB number? Uh, it's on the back of your book. Not on the back of your book? ISBN 13. I got 13 and 10. Yeah, I think I have a different edition than y'all. Okay, well, we'll correct that. Uh, also, it says, and I'm going to tell you on page 27, but it's probably wrong. Jesus said, Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He goes on to say, If we are fed by every word that comes out of the mouth of God, we ought to study every word. Today, preachers have lost sight of that. So if we're not preaching the whole counsel of God's Word, are we really holding to a high view of Scripture? Look with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Another familiar passage to you. And it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Rebuke. Teaching, doctrine, for reproof, or rebuke, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So some of Scripture is inspired, right? When I went to Bible college, I went to a fairly liberal college and every single professor I had that taught Bible believed in the Dalmatian theory of inspiration. Let me explain that. You know the dog, right? What does the dog have? Spots. spots. They believed that the Bible was inspired in spots. My question to them was, and they didn't like it, is how do you know what spot is inspired and what spot isn't inspired. And then I would take them over here to this passage and ask them to explain that little word, A-L-L. -L. Someone help me with that. What does that mean? Everything. Everything. And it is inspired or God breathed. And, and how did that happen? Well, God spoke through them. And, and the Lord Jesus himself told us that every jot or jot and tittle were important. The very words are important for us. Now, they were not mechanical robots just, you know, dictating. God used them. God used their personalities, their writing styles, and, and the gifts that he had given them. And, and that's why... To me, the Bible is one of the most amazing. If you want to look at uh, things, like a, a piece of literature, if you want to look at it that way, it is so amazing because you have a, a book that's been written over a span of 1,500 years by 40 different authors, and, and I tell you what, the continuity of it is unbelievable. Now, I just happen to be one of those nuts that believes in, that the Bible is... Um, without error, uh, that it does not fail in any way. I'm one of those nuts that believes it is truth. Okay? Every single word. I even kind of like the maps in the back too. 
But every single word is God's word given to us. That is what the church needs to come back to. Church needs to study it, the, the Word of God. It is, why did God give us the Bible in the first place? So that we can beat people over the head with it? It works, I guess, in some cases, but is that why? No. What is God, why then? Why has God given us? He wants to instruct us. Well, it's to instruct us. We, that, that is true. To beat us. But it's, it's more than that. He is the Word. He is the Word. You're getting real, real warm. You mean He wants to be identified. He wants to be, right. In other words, the Word of God is about whom? God. God. And it is God revealing Himself to whom? Us. Us. That's what it's all about. And through it, it's so beautiful because God is revealing his redemptive plan for mankind on how he is saving us through Jesus Christ. Problem is, don't, you know, if Christians don't want to read it and take the time to read it, why would the lost want to do it? If we're not excited about worship, why would the lost want to be excited about worship? If the church doesn't have a high view of God, and we don't think that the uh, God is uh, the Word of God is the absolute authority of our lives, then why should the world look at it that way? It depends who is looking at it. And well, I agree. I you know I want I want the uh, world to look at God first of all. Because we're going to fail. I mean, isn't that true? We've all failed. Well, um, who is this true church there? Who is the true church? Those who have trusted in Christ Jesus as a personal Savior. That is the true church. And we're being sanctified right now. We're in the process of sanctification and growing and to be more like Him. But the laws, the way uh, it was put in the Bible, that a lot of people did. You think it's like, see the word, and they go right to it. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people in the church who is truly lost won't won't go to the word. Yeah, I don't. It doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Yeah. However, by the way, who illuminates our hearts to understand God's word in the first place? God does. God does through His. Spirit, 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 through the Holy Spirit. So we need to remember that. I always tell people, if you have a hard time understanding the Scriptures, ask the author. Can I make a distinction? You know, if you say during the time of Jesus, the problem that he had to deal with was a polytheistic. Right. And what we deal with now in the church is humanistic. Right. Because, you know, uh, man now has elevated himself. It, even the early church Christ dealt with, he had to deal with multiple gods. Right. Wrong identification. Now we have to deal with the humanists. Right. Who believe that man can fix this. We kind of, yes. And we we kind of put ourselves in place of God. Right. Right. And that's right. a serious problem. We, we have lifted man up. And, uh, you know, we look around at all of our accomplishments and we pat ourselves on the back. But what have we forgotten? A high view of God. A high view of God. Uh, in fact, we came into this world with nothing. We'll leave with nothing. In between, everything we have, God has given us. I don't care if you're saved or unsaved. Everything you have is by the grace of God. Yes. I believe our uh, reflection is really our uh, justification validation. Uh, how we hold ourselves. I, I think that's what this country has gotten away from. I believe that this country has become ecumenical and, and, and more tolerant. Back in the 60s, we were talking about political correctness. Now we're talking about uh, tolerance and, and adding works to faith. And uh, it's, it's just really destroyed doctrine. Yeah, I and I think that's why God has, has pulled away from this country as much as he has. And, and that was, brings us to really our, our third point here. The third point is sound doctrine. 
you can't have sound doctrine if you don't have a high view of God and believe in the absolute authority of Scripture. In other words, we have to be obedient to the Scriptures. When, when you and I have something opened up to us in the Scripture and, and God challenges us from where we're at, we have to change. We have to be obedient to that and let God change us. But there's got to be sound doctrine. If the church doesn't have sound doctrine in the pulpits, in the Sunday school classes, we're in a world of trouble. I was visiting a Sunday school class years ago. I was wet behind the ears pastor. I was invited to come to speak in view of a call at this church. And I went to the Sunday school class and this older lady was teaching the class. And she told us in class that God doesn't mind if we tell a little white lie. I was trying to find a, a chapter or a verse for that. You see what's happening? People, we're, we're teaching Oprah, we're teaching Dr. Phil, we're teaching everything but the scriptures. Humanish. Yeah. Another man told me one day, he says, well, you know, Brother Randy, that godliness is next to cleanliness, or cleanliness is next to godliness, whatever it is. Not one of my favorite phrases. And he says, you can, you can bank on that because it's in the Bible. I must have the wrong version then. Got to have sound doctrine. Why is it important for the church to have sound doctrine? There it is, Ephesians 4.14. Why? Well, you want to keep the sheep what they're supposed to be. Yeah. What does that verse tell us? That we should no longer be children. Children. I love children. In fact, I was working with the children last night in our church. Had one little boy that was just about as disrespectful as he could be. And if he was my son, I probably would have wore him out. But other than that, I did like working with children. <laughs> and I still do a little bit. <laughs> but children are children. What happens when you put children together. They act like children. Right? And what do we hope for our children? That they stay children and stay goofy and immature? And Is that what we hope for them? They take them high. Well, I tell you what, what we want is for them to grow up, don't we? We want them to mature. You know, some of us want our children to be doctors and nurses and, you know, have, have good jobs and so, you know, we usually have great dreams for our children. I was just hoping mine would survive, you know. And uh, God did a wonderful work there. But here he's saying that we should no longer be children. He doesn't want us to stay as children. He wants us to grow up in the faith. He wants us to mature. Why? Because we can be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the way, that's happening today big time. Yeah. And I don't mind mentioning certain people, folks. <laughs> but there are some writers out there and some people on television that are carrying this, these doctrines and it's just blowing people about. and they're, they're not anchored to anything. And the reason they're not anchored to anything is because they're not anchored to the Word of God. You mentioned earlier this health and prosperity preaching that is going on. Folks, it's a doctrine of demons. I'm not afraid to say so. Listen, Paul the Apostle apparently got it wrong if he was supposed to be prosperous. You know, when they let him out of the maritime prison and outside of Rome and put his head on the chopping block, that was not prosperity in, in the world's view. He got promoted that day. But he didn't have much prosperity on this earth. And in fact, when we talk about prosperity, what, what happened? We're pointing the fingers back at us. We're not looking at a high view of God. We're exalting man once again, folks. I don't think nobody would want to hear that uh, the world will end badly. They basically want to hear about a utopian society. Yeah. That man can fix this. Yeah. Man can. No. Can't. And one, Professor, the Articles of Faith and the Covenant in the church. Yes. 
which most churches would say when you establish a church, you must have two things, your articles of faith and your covenant agreement. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, most churches do. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we okay. go along. Right. Okay? Right. And uh, Because even in those areas, it better be based on sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. Right. Uh, because, you know, what's happening today is quite dangerous. Uh, here are some of the passages that you can look at. Uh, those of you who took my class on uh, pastoral epistles will, rem will remember 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. We had to deal with the issue of sound doctrine there. Uh, Timothy apparently was running into a problem where he was at in Ephesus with uh, false doctrines coming up within the church. It wasn't sound. It wasn't healthy. And what happens if you don't have a sound doctrine within your church? Well, you can't have a healthy church. If you don't have a high view of God, you do not have a healthy church. And of course, if you don't have a high view of God, you probably don't have a high view of Scripture. Or at least the absolute authority of Scripture there. And again, you become a little bit more unhealthy. If you don't have sound doctrine, you're not going to be a healthy church. It's just not going to happen. God wants us to have a healthy church, by the way. He's given us His Word to guide us and to direct us. And so that's what He, he wants for the church. He wants a church with sound doctrine. But not just sound doctrine, because sound doctrine leads to something else. And it leads to... That. Hold on. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a little bit better at this, Josh, but not much better. You would think when you click on that little dot that says click, there it is. Personal holiness. Why is personal holiness important to the church? right living before God. Okay, it's right living before God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him. What is holiness? Being set apart to God. Okay. Being set apart to God or for God for His use. Um, that's, a, that's very good. You could call it a standard in a sense too. Because it's connected to that. Uh, God is holy. To me, that's the definition in one sense because there is nothing else on this earth I know that's holy. Except for the fact that you and I have been declared holy because of our salvation in Christ Jesus. But think about that. We weren't always holy. And we might have a standing before God in holiness. But think about personal holiness of the church. Answer the question, has God really set a standard for the church? Someone look up 1 Peter 1.16 and tell me, if God set a standard for the church? I know, that's hard. Well, why don't you look up this one? The new words. <laughs> Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. That is a quote, by the way, from Leviticus 11.44. Be holy, for I am holy. Who's holy? Who's the holy one? God. God. He's the standard, right? right. We all agree. Mm -hmm. So what are we to be? Oh. Is God set a standard for His church? Yes. Yes. By the way, I, I, I grew up in a home that was a little bit legalistic. 
And I'm thankful, though, that I grew up in a home where I was protected from a lot of things. And I understand the teaching of Scripture about freedom and all that, and liberty. However, there's still a personal standard of holiness that we must hold to. So, what do we do with that? What does the church do with that? Where do we go with that? We don't talk about it much in churches anymore. We don't talk about separation from the world because you know one thing the church is supposed to be is distinctively different from the world. But I go into a lot of churches. Sometimes I can't tell the difference. And I'm not talking about worship services. I'm not talk I'm talking about people's attitudes. I'm talking about their lifestyles. And, and, and I'm not picking on any particular thing, you know. Back back in the day it was chewing and tobacco and smoking and this and that. That's all I'm talking about. I'm talking about something much deeper than that. We're supposed to have a life-changing experience in Christ Jesus. We're told in uh, what is it, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things of what? And things are what now? Become new. I don't see a lot of new sometimes. I, I, I read an article about a, a, it was a celebrity that went to a Billy Graham crusade and they were writing a, a little article about how they were so glad that they prayed the sinner's prayer. And they said, well, trust in Christ. And he said, I didn't have to, nothing, nothing's changed in my life. I'm just so glad I didn't have to change. I'm like, really? What's that all about? Because it's all about change. It's all about personal holiness. And, and I believe we're talking about sanctification or the process of sanctification. We're growing from one glory to another glory. That we're growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. I hope that we are more spiritually mature today than we were a year ago. If not, then there's something wrong with our personal holiness. And I believe our personal holiness is tied to sound doctrine. I believe it's tied to an absolute authority of God's Word. And I believe it's tied to a high view of God. All these things are tied together. Our, it's so important to our walk in Christ. We have to have personal holiness. Now that doesn't mean that I am to take what my standards and, and put them on to Elam. You are each personally responsible. However, I believe there should be a level of personal responsibility over the whole church, don't you? Yeah. I think there are certain issues that we need to deal with in the church that we don't deal with anymore. When was the last time your church has practiced church discipline? And I'm not saying drag somebody out and stoning them. Okay? Too many churches have done that in the past and misused church discipline because the whole idea is to restore the sinning brother or sister in Christ. But we don't even do that anymore. And I think the reason we don't do that is we're afraid to do it. Not we're afraid maybe to lose that person, but we're also afraid because we know that we're not right with God. And if the pastor's not right with God, and the deacons aren't right with God, and the musicians aren't right with God, and the congregation isn't right with God, why should we even bother? We can't restore because... We really don't have the high view of God that we think we have. We really don't hold to the absolute authority of scriptures. We're not really teaching sound doctrine. I'm, I, maybe I'm drawing a very dim picture of the church, but let me remind you something. It is still Christ's church. It still belongs to Him. He is still at work. He is not abandoned to the church, nor will He. It is the bride of Christ. I don't think you. But painted, folks, that should spur us on to holy living. Yes. I don't think you painted a 
I, I think you had mentioned before, as far as fear, uh, when you walk into the church, there's a certain amount of holiness and a certain amount of uh, respect and mm -hmm. fear you have, you know, beginning the beginning of wisdom. Right. And uh, how you live. And Paul, he said in his famous, what the law couldn't do. Right. Uh, you know, I don't think we're saying that holiness, someone asked me one time, is holiness attainable? Okay. Uh, when, Pete, when Paul said, with my mind, I serve the law of God. With my flesh, the law of sin. Right. Old wretched man that I am. Did it go down to the other law? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You have to develop that life in Christ Jesus and say to God, I want to live a holy life. Help me. Yes. And he will. Yeah. Even though, you know, and some people will argue, well, that's not attainable. Why bother? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the thing is, God still has a standard. That's right. He's not going to change a standard. No. Not not. For, that's why he sent the Lord Jesus Christ to die for our sins. Because he can't change his standard. Right. He won't change his standard. That's right. And so there had to be uh, an atonement for that sin. Because he said what the law could not do. Right. Because of sinful flesh. Right. He said the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And once you know that, and then you are so grateful mm -hmm. that you try your best to live a holy life. Well, and that's it. Again, it goes back to a heart of worship. Mm -hmm. We get back to the part of Deuteronomy 6, 5, love the Lord your God with all your heart. When we have that relationship with God and we truly love Him with all our heart, instead of pointing at ourselves and, you know, all that, but loving God with all our heart, an outward expression of our love, we're going to, you know, no, you and I are not going to reach perfect, uh, sinless state here, Okay? Not going to happen. However, we can get mighty close yeah. when we let God work in our lives. Yeah. But but it's about the it's about the experience of growing in the grace of knowledge. It's a it's a continuing thing. We should be always moving forwards, never stepping backwards. And what you say about but we do step backwards from time to time. What happens? Well, it's like a, a black preacher I knew. He says, "Well, when you fall, don't wallow." He said, "Get up." And that's what we should do. Get up and continue on for Him. That's part of the journey of growing uh, in, in the holiness of God. Someone asked me when he told that lady, he said, go and sin no more. Yeah. Now, <laughs> was it that sin, that particular sin, or was he talking about all sin? I, actually, I really like that in a counseling situation, that verse, because, you know, there are times when people, you're, you're there, you're dealing with these issues, and you just want to yell, stop sinning. <laughs> you know, just stop. <laughs> and Paul probably would say the same thing to himself. Right? Paul would say, Paul, stop it. You know, there were times in his life that he struggled. And, and so personal holiness is very important. A healthy church, a healthy church now, is going to deal with such issues. And they're going to walk uh, a personal holy walk. Let me go to our next slide. And uh, maybe. Did I get there? Nope. Doing backwards one. Went backwards. I'm going to have to get my clicker next week. Spiritual authority. Ah, here's a touchy one. Spiritual authority, number five. Who is the head of the church? Jesus Christ. Thank you. <coughs> Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1.22, Ephesians 4.15, Jesus, our Christ, is the head of the church, and the church must understand that Jesus is the head of the church. If Jesus is the head of the church, then we back up, we're to live holy lives because the Bible tells us so. We keep backing up. We've got to have sound doctrine. We keep backing up. We've got to have a high view of the absolute authority of God's Word. We've got to back up one more and have a high view of God. But it all leads up to spiritual authority within the church. Our authority in all matters is Christ. Christ. Okay, let me get a little bit stickier then. 
John MacArthur says, and in my book it's on page 29, a church must understand that Christ is the head of the church and that he mediates his rule in the church through godly elders. Did you catch that? He mediates his rule in the church through godly elders. You need some scripture for that? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, and also verse 17 of that same chapter. The church is struggling with this very issue today. God has given Christ the church. The church belongs to Christ, right? He has under shepherds. The under shepherds are whom? The elders of the church. The pastors of the church. I don't care if you call them pastors, bishops, whatever. They are the elders of the church. Now, just a quick word here. They're, they are not to lead the sheep in, in, a, in such a way where, uh, I shouldn't say, they shouldn't push the sheep, although a lot of them seem to have to today, but they should lead the sheep. The sheep should be willing to follow. So what is the problem today in the church? Why is this not happening? Because I believe that most churches would say that Christ is the head, after all, Matthew 16, 18 says what? That it is Him. He, it's His church. He built it. I will build my church. Okay? So with that in mind, what's the problem with the churches today? Uh, you know, they are not seem to be willing to admit or believe or accept that Jesus had called men, pastors, to be in spiritual authority over a church. I think one of the problems is that people have other altars as far as authority. I, I know in some churches, the fraternities and sororities, leaders are more important than pastors. Uh -huh. And I yeah. know in some churches, there are secret organizations where those leaders are more important than the pastor. Yeah. Spiritual authority. They get more spiritual authority from those people than they from the church. Yeah, we're going to be dealing a lot more with this issue in, in the future weeks. Yeah. We'll give some time to this because this is a real issue today. Uh, we have one member of our class who wrote an extensive paper on this issue, so I'm looking forward to him sharing. Right, Kenneth? Yes, sir. Uh, he took a class over the holidays on eldership, and and so I'm interested in, I've read his work, it's very good work. And, who, wrote, and who wrote the paper? Kenneth did. Did he copy you? I'm going to copy him. Oh, you're going to copy him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, he might turn that paper in again, and I would not know probably. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, there's, it's a real issue today. Uh, when I went to one particular church as pastor, uh, I didn't find out till some time later that what they wanted was just someone to get up and give a devotional every Sunday. When it came to the leadership of the church, no pastor, the, we the deacons will take care of that. It was a year later after taking that church that I discovered that the church had a million dollars in stocks and bonds and CDs. And it was a small little church and I started thinking, wow, what is all this here? And I challenged the deacons and asked them, what is it here for? Well, just in case we need it in case of emergency. What kind of million dollar emergency are you going to have? You have insurance. You have, uh, why, and I asked him, I challenged him, why has God given you this money? Well, pastor, that's not for you to meddle in. 
And I said, well, can you imagine if we just took 10% of that money? Now, we were in a town that had maybe 800 people. So could you imagine if we took $100,000? And I, I'm Southern Baptist, so I, would, I told them, and call the Georgia Baptist and ask the Georgia Baptist to help us come in here and do evangelism with a hundred. Can you imagine how far a hundred thousand dollars would go? I said, what are the, and we're just talking 10% of that money. Well, we can't do that. You're meddling. And I, I challenged him. I said, guys, I do not want to be the pastor. That is standing before the Lord Jesus Christ and said, what did you, what did you accomplish at Milan Baptist Church? Oops. Strike that on the tape. Well, actually, I really don't care because they should know better. Okay? And basically, I told them, listen, I do not want to be standing before Christ and said, well, we saved up a million dollars. Didn't want to do that. Because I don't think that's what God intended. Now, I'm not saying that we should have spent it for that. I think we should have prayed about it and we should have asked God for his guidance. But the problem was, they didn't want the pastor to have any part of a vacation Bible school, with a music program, with anything that was going on in that church. Pastor, you visit the sick, you give us a devotional message on Sunday, and we're good with that. Stay out of everything else. That's our business. Well, can I tell you something, folks? That's not what Scripture says. Now listen, I, when it comes to money in the church, I'm going to give you some advice. If you're ever a pastor, stay far away from it. Stay far away. Put as many firewalls in between you and that money. I don't want to know who's giving, how much is being given by people. I just want to know, are we paying our bills and... and Let's put a, together a faith budget and let's see what God wants us to do and let's, you know, God will provide. I'm, I'm just that kind of nut. I mean, after all, you can't spend what you don't have, right? That's right. And, and so I believe that if God wants us to do something, He'll provide. But the thing was, is that particular church didn't want me to be the elder. They wanted to give that job to the other folks. In fact, they didn't even want me to come to committee meetings. The only committee meeting I got to go to was a financial committee meeting when they wanted to cut my salary because giving was down, even though they had a million dollars in the bank. By the way, see this pretty church back here? It's one of the best churches I ever pastored. Bethlehem Baptist, I'm going to say it. Bethlehem Baptist Church in Worthen, Georgia. Great people. Love the Lord. Were they perfect? No. They didn't have a perfect preacher, by the way, either. But one of the things that makes this church different than a lot of churches is they loved and respected the authority of God's Word and they loved their pastor. Makes a big difference. The reason they loved their pastor is because they loved Christ. And the reason they loved Christ was because they were working on their personal holiness. And they had sound doctrine. And they believed that when the Word of God said something, they needed to do it. It was an amazing process that I went through. When I first went there, the, the way they went and called deacons. And I said, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible teaches. And I started sharing with them what the Bible says about calling deacons and, and, and what deacons are supposed to do. Did you know that they started to fall right in line with that? Do you Not because they took my word for it. Guess what they started doing? looking at the Scripture. And they said, well, Brother Randy, you're right. That's what the Scripture does say. We need to change it. Well, I'll tell you, there's some great folks out there like that today. There are, you know, I don't want you to, I don't want you to get to the point that you're thinking that there are hardly any good churches out there. There are no perfect churches. Do not try to find the perfect church and go there. You'll ruin it. Okay? There are no perfect churches. Go to the church that God has called you to and serve in it. And begin to put all these things into practice. One of the things I tell my children, love your pastor. He's the leader of your church. He's the one that God had placed there. Love him. Serve under him. 
Help them any way you can. Do the work of the ministry through the local church. Tell them to love God and to love Scripture. Tell them to be obedient. And that's what it's all about here. Uh, we need to come to the point, just remember that this is not our church when we go. I happen to go to New Liberty and it's not my church. Whose church is it? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Who do you put in charge of it? Christ. And, and under Christ? Who's under shepherd? Holy Spirit. Yeah. Okay. And I share that because I think the local church has forgotten this. And the only way we're going to get back to this is what? Sound doctrine. In order to have sound doctrine, we have to have the absolute authority of God's Word. In order to have the absolute authority of God's Word, we have to have... Copy of God. Right. Let me just uh, real quick go through these last few things. Uh, I got about... 20 more pages of notes, but we can't do this. This is chapter 2. We move from the skeletal system, the structure of the church, to the internal systems in chapter 2. And he says that the internal uh, systems are the spiritual attitudes that the church should have. First of all, I believe every church should be a spirit-filled church. Right? If it's not a Spirit-filled church, we're in trouble. By the way, we've been given the Holy Spirit of God. We need to yield to the Holy Spirit of God. It is the Holy Spirit of God that gives us spiritual gifts so that you and I can function as a body in Christ in the local church to carry out the various ministries that He's given that church. No two churches are alike in function in that way. In other words, uh, you know, so many people try to copy another church God, God wants us to minister to the people in our community, which means that each community is different. Each church is going to be different. Each church is going to have different gifts and able to serve within that community. And, and so we need to remember that. Uh, you know, I used to go to the Jacksonville Pastors Conference at First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, and I am awed by the ministries of that church. And so I come back to my little church and all of a sudden I want to build a three-story high uh, preschool building. And over here I want to have a parking garage. And that's great, but when you only have 800 people in your town, that's just not going to work, is it? <laughs> Jacksonville is a little bit different from the little town I was in. Not the same thing. So your ministries are not going to be exactly the same, are they? But what is the same? Well, what is the same is what we just discussed, those last five things. You know, we have to have the, the skeleton there. You know, we have to have that structure there. We have to have the sound doctrine and all those things. But the internal systems, these are important too. Uh, he, John MacArthur uh, talks about, he says, just as a body has internal works made up of organs and fluids to function, the church has internal spiritual attitudes so that it can function. And so he lists 15 of these. And there's no way I'm going to, you know, be able to go in depth on any 15. But you can read the book and you could go a little bit deeper and we'll be able to go a little bit deeper in time. The first one is obedience. John 14, 21, he who has my commandments or, and keeps them. It is he who will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. We're, we're told in several passages that obedience is important. Uh, in uh, 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, we were looking at that passage a little bit earlier, where be ye holy for I am holy, he ties obedience and holiness together. They're important. You, you know, obedience leads to holiness. Okay? Uh, Titus 2, 11 through 12, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And he just goes on. There's passage after passage that we can look at. But one of the important internal... What, what, 
that's so important to the church and so important for the believer is what? To be obedient to God. The second thing is humility. John MacArthur writes, when we came into God's kingdom, we came destitute beggars who had nothing to offer. We were spiritually bankrupt. The fact is, is you and I have nothing to be proud about, do we? Think about that. Uh, as I said earlier, everything we have in this life, God has given us. We come with nothing, we leave with nothing. And, uh, and so there is no room, no room for pride in the church. Yet it's there. It raises its ugly head. Instead, we're to have hearts of humility. Uh, we're told in Luke 9.23, it says in Luke 9, 23, if anyone desires to come after me, he must what? Deny himself. Deny himself. So we're called to deny ourselves, or deny ourselves for him. So we have a heart of humility. Um, a lot of arrogance in churches sometimes. We have to deal with that, don't we? We have to work on that. It's part of our flesh. Uh, I tell you, one of the hardest things for me as a pastor, every once in a while, it happens. Rare, Larry, but it happens. I'll preach a really great sermon. <laughs> and I just wowed myself. And I'm like, wow, that was good. And I'll stand at the back door and people are shaking your hand here. What do they say? Good sermon preacher. Boy, that head just gets a little bit bigger gets a little bit bigger. And you get done with all that and you get in the car with your wife and I'm waiting for her. Nothing. <laughs> and then she reminds me I didn't write it. I might have wrote the sermon but I didn't write the Bible. I didn't come up with anything new. It all belonged to God. She always put me back in my place. Sometimes we, we, we need to remember that even as pastors, as Sunday school teachers, uh, that, that pride is really an awful thing. In fact, in the book of Proverbs, it tells us in chapter 6, verse 16, that it, it says, these six things the Lord hates. And then he says, yes, seven are abomination to him. The reason he says six and seven is why? It's not because he made a mistake. Several of words. Yeah, well, he's saying that six and then seven, he's saying this is not a finished list. God hates sin, period. Okay, right. This list is not done. But he gives us these things. And he says this, number one, a proud look. We can stop right there, folks. Whew. Man. There is no place for it in the church. Got to be careful. Got to guard our hearts from it. I mean, I even get in trouble when I talk about the uh, the, Fer the Pharisee and the man who went in there, the tax collector who was beating on his chest, and and uh, he's, he's talking about you know where he, the other guy goes in and says, "Boy, I'm glad I'm not like that sinner." And I'm thinking, boy, I'm glad I'm not like that <coughs> Pharisee. And I'm thinking, I'm doing the same thing. I think God made it that way, so we would try to, you know, we'd catch ourselves, you know. We say, I'm glad I'm not like that Pharisee, and, and we're just as bad. Pride. It gets in the way of the boy to destroy a church. It's bad when the pastor has it. It's bad when the deacons have it. It's bad when the congregation has it. But it happens. God calls for us to have hearts of humility. I like what it says in Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. God is saying, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? Can you imagine him looking at the temple? Where is this house that you're going to build for me? And where is the place of my rest? Listen to what he says. For all those things my hand has made. And he says that all those things exist, saith the Lord. Then he says this very next thing. He says, but on this one 
will I look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Wow. I don't care about your buildings. I don't care about your temple. Who do you think built that thing anyway? Who gave you the knowledge? Who gave you the ability? Who gave you the materials? Who gave you the strength? Why are you so proud about what you have? You can take it away just like that. Amen. So humility is important. Then he goes on to talk about love, the supreme command. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God, and he who does not love does not know God. For God is love. 1 John 4, 7 through 8. By the way, what is love a byproduct of? I'll give you a hint, it's found in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, 23. Spirit. Thank you. It's a byproduct of the Holy Spirit. Love is a byproduct of the Holy Spirit. Right? So if you don't have a spirit-filled life today, what does that say about your love? It's not genuine. Mm, not genuine. If love is not evident, then we are either unsaved or disobedient. I'm going to put it as simple as that. And I get tired of people saying, well, I love them, but I don't have to like them. I can't find that in my Bible. <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. A church that is not characterized by love is a disobedient, and might I add, dysfunctional church. I've seen a few. You may have too. Love in a church should be as natural as breathing. Why is there no love in some churches today? It goes back to pride, maybe. We're turned inward. We're not under the authority or absolute authority of God's Word, being obedient to what He teaches. He goes on to unity. Unity. I love Acts 2.46 where it talks about them being in one accord. The Greek word there comes from uh, a compound word meaning uh, homo meaning some or same and thymos being the principal life of thought. That's the idea of being same minded in a sense. But being in one accord, well how does that happen? Well the passage tells us that there's one body, one spirit, one baptism, right? We're all baptized in Christ. We need to remember that sometimes. And so unity is important. And, and Paul tells us in one place where it talks about keep the unity, the idea of the Greek verb there is not is maintaining. We have to maintain that unity. In fact, there was a, a, a problem with unity in the church of Corinth. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul was having to deal right off with a, a problem of unity. And so we need to build unity. We need to come back to really the basics. And the basics is our faith in Christ, right? By the way, I love what Rick Warren says. I'm not a huge Rick Warren fan, but it's all about God. you got to come back to that. And that's where we find our unity. Then he talks about a willingness to serve. There's got to be an inward moving for us to serve. Why is it that so many of our churches, the majority of people do not serve? They just occupy pew space. Week after week after week, I know we struggle trying to find people to fill positions and to serve, and, and it's just not happening. And I think it's because that the majority of people sitting in our pews, there's something wrong in their relationship with God. Might sound kind of bold, but I believe that. The next thing is joy. 
Joy and happiness are not necessarily the same thing. But I think much of Christianity has lost its joy. There should be joy in serving Christ. You know, there should be joy in teaching a Sunday school class or s s telling someone about Christ. There should be joy. There should be peace. We need a lot more peace in some churches. But we should have the peace that passes all understanding and that comes through Christ. By the way, that's a, that's a spiritual fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Thankfulness. Wow. It's another one that John MacArthur gets. We're to be thankful. Self-discipline. We need that in the church, don't we? How many churches are self-discipline? Accountability. Well, that's one we don't like to talk about. I believe that every pastor and every church leader should have an accountability partner. Someone that they can sit down with and share. It's important to be accountable. We're always accountable to God, aren't we? But we need to be accountable to one another. Forgiveness. was a big one for the church. Again, uh, it's a characteristic that the church must have. We must be forgiving. Not of just one another, but of people that are coming into our church. We need to have open arms and be forgiving. Dependence. I, I, you know, I, I looked at this one. One of my favorite Bible passages comes from John chapter 15. In verse 15, 5, the very last phrase it says, without Jesus we can do nothing. Dependence is being dependent on Christ. How many churches, I wonder, are trying to do things in their own power? What happens when you do it in your power and not Christ's power? Fail. Well, you fail. I mean, I don't care. You know, there are some huge churches in the United States today that I know of, and I'm not going to go ahead and mention them now, but I'm thinking of one in particular that they're just not following God's Word, period. They're, the structure, listen, it may look good on the outside. They may have thousands of people there on a Sunday morning, but it is a spiritual mess and it's not pleasing God. Why? Because they are self-dependent. They're depending on their philosophies, their ideas, and not on sound doctrine or the teaching of God's Word. And they're a mess. They may be large. They may have a great organization, but they're doing it without God. There are many cults today that have built great organizations and do good things. But again, they're doing it without God. They're doing it all in their own power. But for it to really count, we have to do it in God's power. We have to depend on Him. Then we have to have a desire to grow or growth. And I, and I don't think it's just numeral, you know, just not, we're not talking numbers here. We're talking about spiritual growth. The church should desire to grow spiritually. We were talking earlier, Kenneth, and you were talking about how after you were saved that you just had a hungering for God's Word. That's yes, what sir. we're talking about. There should be a hungering for God's Word to the point that, hey, this is something I want to do, i got to do. We've got to get into that. Faithfulness. Boy, is that a biggie today. We're in a world that really doesn't consider that a, a very high characteristic at all. I don't care if you're a president or what you are. Uh, we need to be faithful to our spouses. We need to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be faithful. Faithful means being true. Faithful means being reliable. Faithful means uh, being accountable and just being there when, when you're needed. Being faithful. Being faithful to God and true to God. And the last one is hope. Can you imagine a church with no hope? We live in a world with no hope. 
We live in a world that tells us, well, we've come out of some kind of process of billions and billions and billions of years of, you know, some kind of yucky goop from billions of years ago and progressed to this and that. There's nothing more than this. That, that's all there is. Well, that sounds like fun. <laughs> Folks, God gives us meaning. God gives us hope. If any place should have hope, it has to be the church. You and I have to have hope as individuals, as believers. And boy, I, I tell you, I'm excited about the hope that I have in Christ, knowing that someday I'm going to be with Him. Someday there are going to be no more death and taxes. Someday there's going to be no more gout. Someday I won't have to worry about diabetes. And by the way, Jeffrey, when I get to heaven, I'm going to be six foot four. I'm going to weigh 185 pounds. Uh, that's what I'm putting in for. It's a lot of meat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but putting that aside, we need to be excited. Man, God, God is for real. He's coming again. This, is, this part is not forever. The forever part's yet to come. And, and we need to be looking forward to that. But in the meanwhile, we need to be faithful in carrying out all these things. Listen, the church today, many churches are so unhealthy, but you and I can make a difference. How do we make the difference? By starting back at the very beginning, having a high view of God and loving with all our heart. I think that can be contagious. I think if we're willing to do that, and God is begins to, as God begins to change us, those around us will want to have that same change. Well, that's how revival starts. But folks, we we got to have a, a genuine desire to love God with all our heart. And if we don't have that, and I'm going to be honest with you, that's not I'm not there yet. But that's my prayer. Lord, help me to love you with all my heart. Because, man, there's so much flesh in the way. There's so much Randy in the way. And, Lord, may your church love you with all their heart. It's the beginning point. Then we can go from there. Well, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your love for us. And Lord, your church is the bride of Christ. And we thank you for that. And someday you're going to be presented, or you're going to be presenting the bride of Christ. And oh Lord, what a wonderful thing that is. Lord, that, that's, you know, I just can't imagine being able to stand before you and hearing the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But I know it's not because of me, it's because of all that Christ has done. And Lord, I pray for your church today. I pray, Lord, that uh, we would become the church that you want us to be. We know there's a lot of books and there's a lot of plans and there's a lot of programs out there that tell us that this is the way church should be. And Lord, we want you to tell us through your word what church should be. And Lord, I pray that we would just begin, first of all, with loving you with all our heart. Help me to do that. Help each of us in this room do that. Help those who are watching the video do that. Lord, none of us are perfect. We know that. But we have a perfect God who wants to transform our lives. And you have given us your Holy Spirit. And you have given us your Word. And you have given us salvation. Lord, help us to be faithful to you. And Lord, I pray that you would help us in our homework this week and help us to catch up in everything that we need to catch up in. And Lord, I pray you keep us safe until we get back to next week's class. And Lord, in next week's class, I pray that you would be glorified. Again, I thank you for these here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.